Thank you for watching this sermon from Kings Park International Church. Be sure to check out the other sermons in this series as well. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Before I get started, I want to let you know, if you have any questions during the message today, you can share them online in the online chat, or you can text them or email them uh, to the number and the email address that's provided. I'm Dana Williams, and if we haven't had the opportunity to meet, uh, my husband Jason and I serve here at the Durham uh, RTP congregation as elders, and then I also serve full-time on our ministry staff as a pastoral care director, and I oversee life groups and our pastoral counseling and benevolence fund. I've also recently been helping with community outreach, and uh, every time somebody asks you, have you joined a life group yet? If you say yes, I get some kind of benefit to it, okay? So make sure you join your life group this semester. Um, <laughs> We are going to be continuing today in our series called The Basics, and we're going to talk about repentance and baptism today. And this series, The Basics, is a four-part series, comes from the first four chapters of the Purple Book. And if you've been with us the last few weeks, you've been hearing us talk a lot about the Purple Book, and everyone's been talking about how long they've had it, and I'm pretty sure I had a green one before it was purple, but uh, I have done this book many times, many times in groups as well, and the Purple Book One Life Group is where you go over the same topics that we have been discovering in this sermon series. You go over them more in a group setting and have conversation. And this is by far my favorite life group. And I am not lying. Nobody paid me to say that. I think I, 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 like, I've probably done it 25, 30 times. And it, either to participate in or to lead, it's my favorite group. Because these topics, sin, salvation, lordship, and obedience, repentance, and baptism, and the Holy Spirit, we could study these things our whole lives and there's always something new that I learn. And so I encourage you to check them out. There's Purple Book 1 and Purple Book 2. You finish the whole book if you do both of them. But if you have already participated in a Purple Book group, I would encourage you, as Anitra did on our announcement, to please join a group. To not, as the writer of Hebrews uh, is concerned about, forsake meeting together even during these times. Being together is a distinct aspect of being the people of God, of being the church. And so whatever we need to do, whether it's connecting virtually or safely in person, continue meeting together. So as I mentioned, I am going to be talking to you about repentance and baptism. And the title of our message today is Grounded in Faith and Buried with Christ. And we're going to be looking at a passage in Acts, Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 41. But before we read our scripture, I would like to set it up, to set the scene up for you a little bit. And as I'm looking around, I just have to say I am seeing faces that I haven't seen in months. And I am just stoked about that. And for all of you online, thank you for being with us as well. But we are talking about the chapter two of Acts, and I want to set it up for you, and I will have to ask you, every time you read your Bible, please do a setup for yourself. Find out some information about the context of what you're reading so that you can better understand what it is that God is trying to tell us through his word. And so Acts is a book, it's actually the second part of a two-part series, and the first part of that series is the Gospel of Luke. And it's a historical account, the Gospel of Luke, of the life of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus. And then Acts picks up, Jesus is in the first few verses, but it picks up and it's the story of the beginning of the church and how Jesus' disciples went out into the earth and how the church of Christ was really born and how, and how it continued even under persecution. And so this is the book we're reading from is Acts. And it was meant to be read by a Christian as an encouragement for them to keep going in difficult times and to understand this movement that they are a part of. We may take for granted how huge Christianity is worldwide, but at this time, it was just a small thing. It was just beginning. And so this history would have been grounding for them. And so that is the book of Acts. Now, our passage in particular is a response of a crowd to a speech that has just occurred. 
And this speech has been given in the first part of the chapter of two by the disciple named Peter. And you might think, well, a disciple of Jesus giving a speech in the Bible, that doesn't sound super you know, unusual, shouldn't he be doing that? But not too long ago, in the first volume of this work, the Gospel of Luke, Peter was going to hide when people asked him, do you know Jesus? Aren't you one of Jesus' followers? And he was going to hide. He wouldn't, he wouldn't stand up in a crowd. But in the passage that we're reading in Acts 2, at the very beginning, the Holy Spirit, which we're going to hear more about next week when Bishop Ron Lewis shares with us about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has just come upon the disciples. This is the third person of the Trinity. And where Peter before had ran and hid, now one of the things that happens when the Holy Spirit comes upon him is he stands up and begins to declare that Jesus Christ is the Messiah of the Jewish prophetic books, that he is the Lord, that he is resurrected. And not only that, he's telling these people in Jerusalem who have gathered for a festival, who are Jewish, who would have understood the writings that he was speaking about in his speech in the first part of the chapter. He tells all of them, hey, Your Messiah from all of your books, he's already come to the earth. And you know what? You have crucified him. And so that is what's happening. And so then we're going to go into verse 37 of chapter 2. And I hope you'll join us online as we read this together. Now, when they heard this, Peter's preaching, they were acutely distressed. And this is from the New English Translation. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, what should we do, brothers? Peter said to them, repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is for you and your children and for all who are far away, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. With many of the words he testified and exhorted them, saying, save yourselves from this perverse generation. So those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added. And so in verse 37, you see the crowd's response to Peter's accusation, you are the one that have killed him. They were acutely distressed and said to Peter, what should we do? Other translations that are more literal say that the crowd was cut to the heart. And that was a saying or an idiom in Greek that meant that they were disturbed emotionally. That what was happening with, in the words that they were hearing was that they were uncomfortable. They were unsettled, so much so that they had to cry out, what must we do? And Peter responds to them in verse 38 saying, he, and he gives very clear and brief instructions Repent, and each one of you baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, I mentioned before that the crowd that he is preaching to, that Peter is preaching to, is a Jewish crowd. When they heard these words, repent and be baptized, they would have understood what this meant. You see, all throughout the Jewish history, There's recorded times of repentance. You can read about them in the Old Testament. And in baptism, this was also not uncommon in the Jewish culture and even without ceremonial washing and cleansing. And people who would come to faith and and become Jewish, they would be baptized. They'd also be circumcised, a little bit more difficult. And um, then also people who were Jewish who would come to times of where they would, would get convicted about the way they were living, they would also have times of repentance. And in the first volume of our work, in the Gospel of Luke, John the Baptist is actually calling Jewish people to a baptism of repentance. And so the people in the crowd would have understood what he was talking about when he told them to repent and be baptized. Now, I'm not sure about you, 
But repentance is not a word that really comes up in casual conversation for me often. And so we may not be quite as familiar with the whole idea of repentance as this crowd would have been. And even though baptism is more of a cultural norm for us, I'd also like us to take a few minutes and look at the definitions of these terms. Now, you may know that the New Testament and Acts is in the New Testament was originally written in the language of Greek. And so we're going to look at the Greek words that were used for repentance and baptism in this passage to get a better understanding. And so the word for repentance is metanuo, to change one's way of life as a result of a complete change of thought and attitude with regard to sin and righteousness. And then the word for baptism is baptizo, a little easier to remember. To employ water in a religious ceremony designed to symbolize purification and initiation on the basis of repentance. Now, we are having a baptism service today. And if you're watching online, we have moved it back to 1145. So you can drive in and, and safely witness it from your car if you like. We invite everyone to stay. At Kings Park, we do baptize, uh, practicing baptism of immersion meaning people go all the way under the water and then, you know, come back up. That's good. Um, But we get all the way wet here at Kings Park. And then we also believe in a believer's baptism. So we have a lot of kids who are being baptized today. We are not practicing that as a coming of age ceremony. It's because these children have come to faith and they've put their faith in Christ's death and resurrection and are wanting to be followers of Jesus for the rest of their life which is pretty exciting. Now, here we see in the definition that baptism is on the basis of repentance. And since repentance is also not a super common word for us in our culture, we're gonna spend most of our time, the rest of our time, getting a good idea of what repentance is. We can see here from the definition that there's an active, it's an active response. Repentance is not something that we do passively. It's not something that we just go, Yeah, that's good, that's a good idea. And then nothing else changes. Our life changes in repentance. And and as our life changes in repentance, it's like a digging in or a fortification, a grounding of our faith for our roots go in deep when our actions match our attitudes about sin and righteousness. Now what's interesting though, is that this word change comes up that there must be change when there is repentance. And I don't know if you have ever tried to change a bad habit, but change is not necessarily easy. And sometimes the simplest of bad habits, like going to bed too late, can be so difficult to change. Um, There's a great book that I like called Life's Healing Choices, and it's about overcoming bad habits and behaviors. And the author, John Baker, has an interesting insight about change. He says that we refuse to change until the pain exceeds our fear of change. And let me unpack that for you a little bit. Like I said, a bad habit, there's some something bad about it that has some bad consequence. It has some pain associated with it. And there are a lot of bad habits that we have that we may never change because the pain of them is just not enough. Like, I'm not going to stop eating my little bit of chocolate at night, you know? I know that's a bad habit, but it's got caramel in it, and I like it, and I'm going to keep doing it, okay? So that bad habit doesn't, my, my blood pressure's not crazy or anything. It doesn't have a bad enough pain point that I want to change. But there are some things in life, some behavioral things that become so painful that the pain of that behavior is more than the pain that it's gonna take us to change. And so, but there's still pain associated in the change. And so in repentance, we have to understand that there is going to be pain because there is change. Let's look back at our Greek saying. It says that these people were cut to the heart by the hearing of Peter's words. They did not have a flesh wound, the Monty Python, you know, movie he talks about. Um, They didn't have a flesh wound. It wasn't a little prick or a piercing. It says they were cut to the heart. 
This idiom, this phrase was meant to capture the depth of emotional distress that was coming because of these words. And it was so much. They're like, we must change. We must change. Something has to be different. Now, you may have a difficult time imagining a crowd of people calling out, what must we do from something that's happening in front of them? But as Pastor Reggie mentioned, we're really in a time like that right now in our country. We, ever since May, when we witnessed Ahmaud Arbery's killing and when the videos of George Floyd's murder were released, our nation has been cut to the heart. We've been stabbed. Things are not the same. And people are crying out, What must we do for these things to stop happening? And some municipalities, some governing bodies have done things like take monuments down. Some places have changed road names. Building names have been changed. People are seeking for something to do that will change our past that will make things different so that racism and racist killings don't happen in our nation. There's even a Disney ride that's being rethemed, all in the name of trying to separate and change from a painful past of our nation. And I have to tell you that when, I'm, when I see these things happening, especially when I saw the first monument being brought down by a crane, I was immediately reminded of how the people of Israel would tear down idols that they had built to other gods, not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they had built to other gods to worship. And I was like, Lord, why am I reminded of that? It's not really the same thing. We're not worshiping these monuments. But the thing that was sticking or the thing that was pricking me was that the nation of Israel, they would go through these cycles. They would go through these cycles up and down, up and down. And they would worship the Lord their God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they would worship in the temple and they would live the way that God had told them to live. And then they would begin to worship the idols of their culture. They would want to be a great people more than they wanted to be God's people. And they would eventually slide into worshiping pagan idols, building altars. Kings would sacrifice their children. And things, even in the temple, these things were even happening in Solomon's temple at times. And, and then a leader would come or something would happen. They'd have a time of repentance. They'd tear down the idols. They'd worship the Lord their God, maybe for a generation, maybe for a few decades. And then eventually they would begin to worship the gods of the other pagan people, And it just went on and on and on. And my heart was grieved because I was like, Lord, I don't want us to be in a place where we overlook that people have been an oppressor. I don't want to be in a place where we overlook oppression, where we overlook racism, where we overlook putting others down for the sake of of some other goal in our history. I don't want to be here again. Like things are beginning to change, but I want things to Stay changed. I want them to continue to change. We are in the midst of so much unrest right now. And as the people of God, as God's church, as his people, we have an opportunity in this moment of being cut to the heart, of asking the Holy Spirit to come and show us how we can enter into repentance. What does repentance mean like for us in this moment, turning to God's kingdom, taking up the cause of the oppressed in our society and seeing racism eradicated in our church? It has no place here. But it is going to take a move of God, just like it took a move of God for these people to understand what was going on. Let's look back again at these people, this crowd, the Jewish crowd. They understood their history. They're at a Jewish festival. They understood that they were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for their Savior. Unfortunately, 
They were looking for something so different than who Jesus is, something so different than the kingdom of God that when Jesus came, when their Messiah came to the earth, do you know what they did? They killed him. They crucified him because their paradigm was so different. Their idea of kingdom was so different than what God's kingdom is. You see, Jesus in his ministry would say the kingdom of God has come near to you. And his parables, he would say, this is like the kingdom of God. This is like the kingdom of God. This is like the kingdom of God. It was different than what they were living. And when they had a revelation that they had actually crucified their Messiah and that their idea of kingdom was so different, they were cut deep and they had to change. And this is not something that was just a New Testament happening. This is not something that just happened for those people at that time. This was a moment in the history of the world. And I have to tell you, when I first had a revelation of God's kingdom, I came to a moment of repentance as well that has changed my life forever. I grew up in the church. I enjoyed church. I enjoyed Sunday school. My parents are here. I had the same Sunday school teacher, Miss Ruth Anthony. She was amazing and awesome. I liked the way she smelled, and I loved going to her class. And I was there, I think, until I was a teenager, and, and I just loved it. And I went through confirmation, and I did that willingly. And these were things that I wanted to do. But when I got to my teen years, I just wanted to live the way I wanted to live. I wanted to do things the way I wanted to do. There was no change in my life. I mean, I liked the idea of religion. I liked the idea of the Christian faith. But I had not been cut to the heart. And one night, as a young 18-year-old girl, I was lying in my bed, and I heard a voice say to me, who will you serve? Will you serve me or will you serve myself? And I knew because of all those years of being taught, I knew who was talking to me. And it wasn't maybe a week later, I found myself on my knees in my bedroom, weeping for hours over how offensive my young life was to this God who I had just had revelation about. I understood in that moment my own sinfulness, but I also understood that I was forgiven. And I have never been the same. Never, never been the same since that day. When you encounter God's kingdom, realizing you are guilty for God's death, there will be pain because your sin, your unrighteousness, your wrongness, it comes to light in the rightness of God. And though this is evidence of initial coming to God, it is not a one-time occurrence. Through Bible reading, through prayer, through joining a life group, through fellowship with other believers, through inviting the Holy Spirit to reveal to you, we should have moments of repentance all throughout our Christian life as we become more and more and more in line with God's kingdom. And this is something that is true for us as individuals, but we also want this to be true for us as a church. And in this time of social unrest, there is a moment of openness where a darkness of our society is being uncovered. And we have an opportunity to say, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Show us your kingdom so that we can turn away, turn away from another way, from another paradigm, from a way that is not your way, and we can walk in the ways of your kingdom. It will be painful. It's not popular. <laughs> Repentance, changing because of somebody else's ways of thinking, it only comes when we have a revelation of God if you have never had that, I implore you, if you continue to seek God's kingdom, it will come. 
And Christian, I have to tell you, walking a lifestyle of repentance is both wonderful and terrible. (laughs) Because Jesus, you know what? Jesus said, not only that the gate is narrow, for those of you who know the scripture, that Jesus is the way to God, but not only is the gate is narrow, but he says, the road to life is difficult. God gives us grace to walk in it. We're gonna talk about that in just a second, but it is a difficult way. But this is the way we are called to live. It's the way that's full of life. It's full of peace. It's full of promises for all of righteousness. And we want to walk in it. Now let's not forget about baptism. Remember, baptism is a response, it's connected, it's on the basis of repentance. And though repentance is a continual thing that happens in our life, baptism is a one-time event. And it's connected with our initial repentance. As I mentioned earlier, we practice a baptism of immersion where the body goes all the way under the water and comes back up. And in the going down, we are putting our faith in the death of Christ that he died for our sins. And in the coming up, we're putting our faith in Christ's resurrection that he rose again to overcome our sin. And therefore we have new life when we come up out of the waters of baptism. Jesus's body was put in the tomb between the time of his death and the time of his resurrection. His body was put in the tomb. It was buried. And in a way, we are burying that self, that our self that wanted to live our own way. And we are raising up to the self who wants to live God's way. The writer of Romans, uh, Paul puts it this way in 6, 4 through 6. We have been buried with him, Jesus, through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be united in the likeness of his resurrection. We know that our old man was crucified with him so that the body of sin would no longer dominate us so that we would no longer be enslaved by sin. Remember, Jesus took on the nature of human man and walked upon the earth to declare that that God's kingdom had come near. He was in the earth. God's kingdom had come near. He He lived and he died and he rose again and the Holy Spirit came upon the earth so that we could know about God's kingdom and the power and no power over sin. Between death and resurrection was the burial. And there was a time, as I mentioned, where his human body went into grave. And in that baptism, that old man, that one that wants to do whatever we want is buried. And when we come up out of the water, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and we receive power to live a new life. This is a great sacrament of the Christian faith. It is a great sacrament. It is a holy moment. It is not something that's like, okay, they got their, you know, I'm a Girl Scout, their silver award in Girl Scout. That's great. No, these children are making a statement that I will live for Christ. They're grounding themselves. They're being, their old self is being buried and they're living to him. Something amazing is happening when our thoughts and our faith get aligned with our physical body and our mental body and we go down in the waters of baptism. Repent and each one of you be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. These, peri- these are Peter's words and they are old, but they are still the same for us today. When we are emotionally distressed as the crowd was, when we have revelation of God's kingdom, if you are upset by what's going on in the world today, praise God that you're upset. Because if we were not upset by this, then we would have no revelation of God's kingdom. Let us rejoice that we don't want to see people killed in broad daylight. And let us fight to see God's kingdom come to the earth through our lives and through our churches. 
In this moment, in this moment, 3,000 people. That was a lot, y'all. I mean, maybe they were, I don't know how many believers there were, maybe 500 or something like that. 3,000 people in an afternoon joined the church. That'd be pretty cool, you know? God moved, and he's still moving in this way today. I have to ask each one of you, especially each one of you that calls yourself a Christian, when is the last time that you repented of an attitude or a thought? If it's been a while, I beg you, ask the Holy Spirit, invite the Holy Spirit in into your Bible reading, into your prayer, into your fellowship time to reveal his kingdom to you. Because in this way, in these revelations, when we change and tweak our lives constantly, 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 going to God's kingdom, going to God's kingdom, coming into God's kingdom, we ground our faith. And all the craziness of this broken world doesn't sway us, though we grieve it. It doesn't uproot us because our roots are deep in the kingdom of God. And I would like to ask you all, even if that's a daily practice of yours, Let's practice a prayer of repentance together today. If you're online with us, take time to practice a prayer of repentance today. I would ask you all, here in person and online, to ta- let's take a few seconds and bow our heads to invite the Holy Spirit to come and reveal how our lives are out of line with God's kingdom. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Okay, now, with that revelation, would you please pray out loud This prayer with me should come up on the screen in just a couple seconds here. Most merciful God, I confess that I have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what I have done and by what I have left undone. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved my neighbors as myself. I am truly sorry and I humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on me that I may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. If you are having your first revelation of God's kingdom, if in this moment right now you are being cut to the heart and you feel the offense that you are to Jesus and you are beginning to understand the part that you played in his death and his crucifixion. If you're beginning to see the sin, that your attitudes of sin and righteousness change, I have very, very good news for you. Jesus died for every wrong thing you've ever done, for every offensive act you've ever walked in. He died for every bad thought you've ever had. He he died for the pre-thought. He died for it all. And he is welcoming you in this moment to put your faith in that death and in the resurrection where he gives you power through the Holy Spirit to overcome. And I ask that you would pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, Thank you for creating and loving me. I confess I am a sinner and I ask you to forgive me. Jesus, I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for making me a new person. Holy Spirit, take my life and help me to follow you and to do your will. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for watching. If you have questions or prayer requests, please email us at info at or message us on one of our social media channels. 
If you would like to give, you can do so by visiting kingspark.org giving or by downloading the Kings Park app.